and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. During the third year of Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, saw another vision following, following the one that already, had already appeared to me. In this vision, I was at the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam, standing beside the Ulai River. As I looked up, I saw a ram with two long horns standing beside the river. One of the horns was longer than the other, even though it had grown later than the other one. The ram butted everything out of his way to the west, to the north, and to the south, and no one could stand against him or help his victims. He did as he pleased and became very great. While I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. This goat, which had one very large horn between his eyes, headed toward the two-horned ram that I had seen standing beside the river, rushing at him in a rage. The goat charged furiously at the ram and struck him, breaking off both his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. The goat became very powerful, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. In the large horn's place grew four prominent horns pointing in the four directions of the earth. Then from one of the prominent horns came a small horn whose power grew very great. It extended toward the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. Its power reached to the heavens where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. It even challenged the commander of heaven's army by cancelling the daily sacrifices offered to him and by destroying his temple. The army of heaven was restrained from responding to this rebellion. So the daily sacrifice was halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. Then I heard two holy ones talking to each other. One of them asked, how long will the events of this vision last? How long will the rebellion that causes desecration stop the daily sacrifices? How long will the temple and heaven's army be trampled on? The other replied, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the temple will be made right again. As I, Daniel, was trying to understand the meaning of this vision, someone who looked like a man stood in front of me, and I heard a human voice calling out from the Ulai River. Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of his vision. As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, he said, you must understand that the events you have seen in your vision relate to the time of the end. While he was speaking, I fainted and lay there with my face on the ground. But Gabriel roused me with a touch and helped me to my feet. Then he said, I am here to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. What you have seen pertains to the very end of time. The two-horned ram represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy male goat represents the king of Greece. And the large, the large horn between his eyes represents the first king of the Greek empire. The four prominent horns that replace the one large horn show that the Greek empire will break into four kingdoms, but none as great as the first. At the end of their rule, when their sin is at its height, a fierce king, a master of intrigue, will rise to power. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause a shocking amount of destruction and succeed in everything he does. He will destroy powerful leaders and devastate the holy people. He will be a master of deception and will become arrogant. He will destroy many without warning. He will even take on the prince of princes in battle, but he will be broken, though not by human power. This vision about the 2,300 evenings and mornings is true, 
but none of these things will happen for a long time. So keep this vision a secret. Then I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for several days. Afterward, I got up and performed my duties for the king, but I was greatly troubled by the vision and could not understand it. Amen. Well, that's a nice, easy passage, isn't it? Over to you, Paul. <laughs> not surprised, Daniel, couldn't understand it, but there we go. Let's just pray for Paul. Father, thank you for Paul. Thank you for the gift that he and Julie are to our church. And I just pray that you'd fill him full of your Holy Spirit now, that he would speak your words and explain what on earth that passage is about. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Amen. Thank you. I'll give it my best shot. I've called this particular sermon, The God Who Acts. So we've now arrived at chapter 8 in the book of Daniel. And from here on until the end of the book, if we had it in its original language, we would see that it reverts back to Hebrew from Aramaic. We're not given any explanation why, but one school of thought is that the emphasis of the chapters in Aramaic was on the Gentile kingdoms and their place in history and prophecy. Whereas now the primary emphasis is God's plan for the nation and people of Israel in the end times. And so in a way, this was like a personal message to the people of Israel. It was the nation of Israel that God had chosen to be the vehicle of his revelation and for his plan of redemption for the world. Through the Jewish people came the knowledge of the one true living God, and the written scriptures, and most of all, the Saviour, Jesus Christ. For salvation is of the Jews, as John says in his gospel. So this is now Daniel's second vision comes two years after his first one and in the third year of Belshazzar's reign. Whilst both the visions are similar, because they point for things that are yet to come, the interpretation given to Daniel for this second vision is more detailed. And so, believe it or not, it's far easier to connect the prophecy to specific events and people in history. Here we see the destiny of earthly kingdoms being mapped out, but also the future for the community in Jerusalem. Once again, we find Daniel functioning as an interpreter of a king's dreams. But but not just that, he's now someone who's receiving the dreams himself. And he needs them to be interpreted. And this time he gets help from a member of God's own team of staff. Here we have the first appearance in the Bible of the angel Gabriel, one of God's supernatural aids. And he explains to Daniel what he's seen in his vision. He'll again help him later on in the book with another vision. And then centuries later, he'll appear to Zechariah and announce the birth of John the Baptist. And then soon after that, to Mary, to announce that she would give birth to the Messiah. So, what's it all about? Well, just as with Daniel's first dream, this vision starts from the time when the Babylonians are still in control of the Middle East. Then it moves on to the time of the Medes and Persians. Under King Cyrus, Persia had gained the upper hand and it had absorbed the former Median Empire. And so the vision depicts the Medo-Persian Empire as a ram with these two horns, one of which is bigger but had grown later. And that just represents how they, those two nations developed. The goat is the Greek empire, 
which brought down the Persians. With Alexander the Great, the spectacular horn that broke when he died suddenly at the age of 32. And the four horns that then grew up, they suggest, as the passage says, the carving up of the empire that he left behind. The biggest part was controlled by one of his generals, a chap called Seleucus. And it covered a massive area to the north and east of Judah. Now, all of this has happened over a couple of hundred years. And then the vision fast forwards a couple of more centuries to the emergence from that kingdom of one of its rulers, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He's the small horn. I'm sure you know him well. He wasn't the rightful successor to the Seleucid throne, but he came to power through intrigue and deceit, just as Gabriel had said he would. And up until the arrival of Antiochus, the vision had focused on the rise and fall of various empires and dynasties. But now the prophecy will shift and it will speak about the way this king, the Seleucid king, would set himself up directly against the people of God, but also directly against God himself. Now, the object of Antiochus' aggression was simply the Jewish people. He was on a program of trying to turn all these areas into good Greeks. That's all he wanted them to be. So firstly, we know from history that he drove out the then high priest, a chap called Ananias, from the temple. And then he put his own puppet in place. But then, because uh, the Jewish people were understandably not very happy, and there was an uprising, and so he attacks the city and he plunders it. He banned, as the passage said, the regular offering made at sunrise and sunset each day. He, pro he prohibited the Jews from honouring the Sabbath. They weren't allowed to. They couldn't practice circumcision. They had to ignore the dietary laws that they'd been given. And any Jew found in possession of any of the copies of the books of the law would be automatically killed. And if that wasn't bad enough, he climaxed this campaign by replacing the Jewish altar in the temple in Jerusalem with an altar to Zeus. And then he sacrificed a pig on it. And I'm sure you can imagine to the people there that had a huge cost to them and also to those who led temple worship. But by setting himself as epiphanies, which meant God manifest, he was also directly attacking the God who lived in that temple. But this desolation of the sanctuary, the stopping of temple worship, it wouldn't be permanent, as the vision makes clear. Antiochus himself would be destroyed, but not by human hand or human power. Now, we're not meant to take that that there weren't any human beings involved in this, but that the ultimate power the one who was directly behind this was God himself. And from history, we know that more or less within that period that was prophesied, Jer Jerusalem was delivered by Judas Maccabeus and his followers. The temple was purified. The altar of burnt offering was repaired. And Jewish worship began again. It's that event that the Jewish people celebrate as the Feast of Lights or Hanukkah. Antiochus went mad while he was still in Persia and he died a short time later. But I wonder, can you imagine being in Daniel's place? He has this graphic vision 
then it's interpreted for him. And all those implications that are there for his people. To be told it was all about the end days, but not to know when that was. To be told that all that he has seen and been told is true. But to seal it up as it lies in the future. I mean, how is that going to fit with Jeremiah's prophecy about the people being released and then being allowed to go back to their homeland? There was so much that he obviously didn't understand. I mean, we, we struggle and we got the benefit of history. So can you imagine what it must have been like for him? I mean, in a sense, he's been told this stuff and he's got nothing to do with it. It's a little wonder, isn't it, that he felt sick and exhausted. But he did what he was told. After a few days in his sick bed, up he gets and he's back about the Lord's business. And God, as we know, as we will continue through our Daniel, he wasn't finished with him yet. But this vision, as Daniel was told, had nothing to do with his time. It related to the time of the end. Both the Old and the New Testament, they regularly speak of a great crisis or deliverance as the end or the last days. It's as if the final judgment or the final inflammation of God's purpose is happening. But the reality is that God's purpose is happening. Though each time it transpires that life and history go on. It's one of those examples of now and not yet. When Antiochus suspended the proper temple worship, it might have seemed to the people then like the end had truly come. It was a period of wrath. The Old Testament sometimes uses that sort of language to denote not that God so much is being wrathful, but they're the kind of events that feels like the result of someone being wrathful. And ultimately, it is God who will intervene and he will bring this time of wrath to an end. If Antiochus had been able to maintain the suspension of true temple worship, it would have been the end. But Jerusalem's spectacular deliverance turned it into an occasion that actually bought the people freedom. I mean, often today we find ourselves, don't we, talking about, oh, we're living in the end times. Especially when we consider some of the imagery in Revelation and how this links back to Daniel's prophecy. But over the centuries, many have imagined that the days they were living in were the end times and have actually planned for that only to find that that wasn't the case but of course a day is coming when God will finally and decisively bring history to an end We'll leave that one aside. We won't dip into Revelation this morning. We've got to move house, don't forget. <laughs> but what lessons can we learn from this vision? What can we learn from the angel Gabriel's words to Daniel? And what can we learn about prophecy in general? When we look back at history, it might appear that it's out of God's control. But this vision makes it very clear that that is not the case. 
the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Seleucids. For a time, yes, they were very powerful. And it must have seemed like that they were totally in control. But God had the bigger picture in relation to all of them. The vision shows us that God was actively involved in their rise and their fall. Sometimes achieving things through them. Sometimes simply letting them go their own way. But always having the overview, the bigger picture. And ultimately prepared to step in when they went too far and needed to be brought to heal. We also see in this prophecy how the horror of human evil is especially concentrated in the state. Daniel's vision pointed to political entities and nations that would rise up in the future, all of which were characterised by violence. One would rise up, then be overturned by another, and the cycle would continue. But when we look at history, we see how none of those mentioned in the vision have remained. They've all gone. And that pattern has continued across the years. And in our more recent history, we've seen how political leaders and regimes that have used violence, such as Hitler and the Nazis, and others like them, they have all ultimately been brought low. Of course, we don't know what, God, what part God may have played in their downfall. But their reigns of tyranny and violence have ultimately come to an end. And coming right up to date, we have regimes in, like that in Russia, more than willing to use extreme violence to further their own ends. Then we have countries like Afghanistan, North Korea, Korea and Somalia, who, according to Open Doors, are the three worst countries for persecuting Christians. When we look at these things, it would be easy to despair and to feel sick at heart like Daniel did. But regardless of how bad things are, God is in control. We may ask, how much longer, Lord, before you do something? But Daniel's vision shows us that a point will come when God says, enough is enough, and intervenes. Now, in the case of Antiochus, it was 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, that particular time has been interpreted in two ways, either to mean 2,300 days or 2,300 morning and evenings, i.e. 1,150 days. Are you still with me? <laughs> but when you look at it, it's really strange that either period fits more or less with what we know happened historically. It just depends where you begin that counting from. Did it begin when the high priest was removed or when the sacrifices stopped? And whether it ended when the temple was reconsecrated or Antiochus himself died? Either fits. But just to make it even more confusing, it could, of course, all be symbolic. But what really matters is that God would and did bring that time to an end. Just as Gabriel had said he would. Back in chapter 7, we saw the term time, times and half a time. We encounter it again at the end of the book. 
we also find the same term book written in the book of Revelation, along with other specific periods of time. And there is so much debate on how we're supposed to interpret those figures. But what they all just simply tell us is that God has set a time limit. There is a limit before he will step in. And that's what's so important and why we can take so much encouragement from this particular vision. A time limit was set on Antiochus and for his attack on the people. And when that time was up, God stepped in and brought him low. And what God has done before, he can do again. Which is why we should never lose hope. Even though sometimes situations may look hopeless. I was particularly struck by what you were saying, Carol, because that's exactly what Daniel says to us. This looks grim, but there is always hope with God. We must never, ever forget the power of prophecy to speak truth across the centuries, just as this vision did. The Bible is full of prophetic words that have come true and are rooted in historical fact. God's revelation to Daniel confirmed the words of the prophet Amos, who lived some 200 years before. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. And that's what he did through Daniel. And as I say, throughout the Bible, we have example after example of God revealing his plan to his prophets. Around 700 BC, the prophet Micah named the tiny village of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Israel's Messiah. The fulfillment of this prophecy in the birth of Christ is one of the most widely known and widely celebrated facts in history. Nobody argues that that was his birthplace. In the 5th century BC, the prophet Zechariah declared that Messiah would be betrayed for the price of a slave. 30 pieces of silver. And what do we find happens all those years later? Matthew tells us that Judas Iscariot was paid that amount to betray Jesus. And it was Zechariah again who recorded the Lord's own words concerning his death. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And then, of course, we have the words of Isaiah 53, written some 200 years before Zechariah, which speak of the suffering servant, all that he will endure, Isaiah doesn't name Jesus, but they absolutely describe all that he would endure in his trial and execution. And none of these are events that are just recorded in the Bible. They are a matter of historical record. We might not have a specific prophecy that directly speaks into what's happening in our world today. But what we see parallels much of what was happening in Daniel's day. We have Russia's war, as I've said, in Ukraine, a war which demonstrates a leader's empire-building dreams, a war he's tried to legitimise by getting the support of the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church. A war that's so far estimated to have cost the lives of four and a half thousand civilians. And then we turn to Afghanistan's persecution of Christians. Leaving Islam is considered shameful. Christian converts face dire and violent consequences if their new faith is discovered. Either they have to flee the country 
or they will be killed. This was true before the Taliban regained control. But obviously since then, that situation has become even more dangerous. And when we look at these situations and others like them, we see that not much has changed, has it, really, since Daniel's day. And as tragic as that may be, it also gives us hope because the God of Daniel's day has not changed. As God himself told the people of Israel, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Those words encourage us to look back at what God has done in the past, how he came to the aid of his people. If he did it then, he can do it now. There's a hymn that says, dare to be a Daniel. Just like him, we can intercede for our world and pray to the same God that he did with the same faith and trust. We can ask God to intervene in what in taking place as he has intervened before. We can ask him to speak to us and give us a word that could bring hope to others, just as he's done before. And prophecy is not just a way either of God revealing information to us, but it also reveals to us about God's character. Daniel's vision shows us that we do indeed worship a God who acts, a God who is faithful, a God who confirms the words that he gives to his prophets, a God who intervenes directly into history, a God who is sovereign. As another of his prophets, Jeremiah, said, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Daniel and history show us how true those words are. Let's pray. Lord, it is sometimes very easy to look at what's going on around us. Sometimes it can be very close to home in families and sometimes it may be when we look at what's going on across our world. And sometimes we may feel like all hope has gone. We may feel despairing. But Lord, this vision that you gave to your prophet all those years ago, when we dig into it, speaks so much into our times. When we look at what was prophesied then and what has come true, and we know and accept that there is still stuff that's being worked out. But Lord, you did indeed act as you said you would. You stepped in. Because you are the God of history. Everything is in your hands and you are sovereign. And maybe perhaps we've never looked to Daniel 8 as a source of encouragement when things seem rubbish. But perhaps if by just sharing a bit of time in this passage today, we can perhaps see it in a new light. And it's take, take the hope that it speaks into our hearts. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that none of it is wasted. Continue to speak to us today, we pray. Amen. Thank you, David.